Now you hear it. When you're a child, you learn there are three dimensions. Height, width, and depth. Like a shoebox. Then later you hear there's a fourth dimension. Time. From Seattle, we are drinking the movies. I'm Taylor Baker. And I'm Michael Clausen. Oh, hey, Michael. It's the end of uh, rescreening batch two. Is that right? Or is this our first batch? I think this is our second batch. Maybe we could let listeners in on the process for our selection of rescreening titles. I don't know that we've ever actually talked about it on air, right? We haven't. And it is, um, you know, it, it's next level genius, really. Basically, we each come up with a list of titles that we want to watch for rescreening. And then um, a great charade and sham of voting occurs. Uh, very high level stuff. It's conducted electronically via text, Excel, email, keep notes on my phone. It's it's really top tier. I think last time we did put uh, it all on paper, mm-hmm. though. But um, yeah, basically we each take turns voting three titles out of eight. Um out of our opponent's Mm -hmm. um, desires. And then we have a order of votes, three, two, one. And three is the best. One is the other side. It's not the least best because the ones that you're not voting for are the least best. It's very, Mm -hmm. very cutting edge technology that we use here. We barely understand it. So we know that the system cannot get hacked. It is a head scratching process to say the least, but we finish each re-screening selection process with a total of six titles that uh, we uh, review over uh, the following six weeks. Months. Yeah, and uh, and then we re-up. So we just finished our last six re-screening titles, and now we're kicking it off again. Yes, so our first impression today will be the first title from that new batch. Uh, and that's going to be Robert Altman's Shortcuts. And then we're going to end this batch of rescreening with Jacques Demy's, uh one of his best titles by far, Donkey Skin, the eloquent fairy tale musical of uh, a very common story that we can all identify with when our dad tries to marry us and our fairy godmother has to get us a donkey skin to flee. Highly relatable stuff. I think this was on your list, if I it remember was. correctly. It but was. you did not have I, to um, twist my arm. Well, I, I was twisting your arm in that we've never snuck a comedy in. And so I looked at the mm. highest rated comedies in your watch list. Mm. And then I chose one that I wanted to watch. And that is the story of Donkey Skin. I, I bait and switched you. It's true. Rescreening titles typically are more sober fair. Yes, I, I think we were looking down the barrel of the gun of a history of violence and Gone Girl at, mm-hmm. at that point in time. and Side we, effects, moodier stuff. Uh, I'm, and then we got on to more brutal war, and uh, it, it's nice to end it on a lighthearted comedy fair. 100%. But yeah, we'll uh, first preview our next re-screening title, Shortcuts. Should we do it? Let's do it. To help with love. Forget what other people do when it comes to me and you. To hell with love. I do something wrong, officer? Take your sunglasses off now. One more question. How many clowns can you fit in this car now? When it comes to you and me, that's the way it's gonna be. If you share my point of view, I'm the woman made for you. When it comes to push a shove, if you're holding out for love. These are strange people, honey. To hell with love. All right. We just watched the trailer for Shortcuts, Robert Altman's 1993 film. What are your first impressions? Before I get to my first impressions, at the end, very slyly, they drop that this is based on the writings of Robert Carver. Um, Raymond Carver, right? Raymond Carver. Mm. Um, When I was 
studying English and, and doing some uh, teaching work as well in college, uh, where I'm calling from a collection of short stories from Carver was actually like part of our syllabus. So I'm, mm. I didn't have a clue that that's the background for this, but he was um, a, you know, manic depressive at best, suicidal depressive at worst, uh, kind of a genius tortured soul artist writer uh, from Bellingham, Washington. Oh, I didn't know um, that. And he famously wrote, like, some of his best short stories, you know, in the laundromat waiting for his co- mm. clothes to dry, you know. I love um, it. Just really, you know, low, uh, um, common denominator type of a person. So I'm I'm very, very interested in this film, even more so now. But, I mean, that cast, the charm, the, uh, the sound motif that Altman invented, essentially, I am... Um, thrilled that i put this on my list i'm very excited as well i i don't think i've seen a single altman movie before i have vague memories of seeing parts of popeye as a kid um me too with like robin williams right definitely the television edit yeah yeah um and i feel like my familiarity with uh altman is primarily just by way of pta uh, mm-hmm. PTA always talks about his his love for Altman, and um, you know I feel like Altman's you know known for m- movies with these sprawling ensembles like this. Um, it's just a enormous cast. Um, you know I think about something like Magnolia, PTA's Magnolia, as sort of his homage to Altman. So that's already kind of the lens through which I'm looking at this, but I'm sure that'll be busted wide open as soon as we get going. <laughs> Magnolia, number 10 on my voting list. Oh, really? Just, nice, just nice. Just barely didn't make it in. Maybe next time. Um, yeah, 183 minutes. I'm looking forward to it. On to Donkey Skin. Well, Michael, like Hail Caesar, there are certain things that I'll just never let go. And that's no donkey skin is probably one of those immortal phrases that I'll just continuously drop to the point where it will get annoying. But um, truly, after watching Donkey Skin, there's very few things that are just no donkey skin. Donkey Skin is now a bar to which other other movies will be compared. Uh Uh-huh. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, I made it through uh, almost the entire box set of Jacques Demy. The only thing I didn't get to was uh, Sherberg. Sure. Oh, Umbrellas? Yeah. No, I did Umbrellas. What's the other one? Rochefort. I, Rochefort. I didn't get yeah, to yeah. The Young Girls or Rochefort. Um, and I am surprised to say that Donkey Skin is my second favorite Demi so far. Mm. Lola being the first. Mm-hmm. I did not expect that. I thought I'd go with umbrellas. I thought I would be mm. uh, engrossed as others were. But I think that Donkey Skin isn't trying to be real to begin with. Mm. And so by having its fairy tale in the book motif, it can do a lot of the um, otherworldly uh, types of filmmaking styles where like the piano doesn't exactly sync. The, the audio mm. might not always sync. Um, mm. Sometimes you can see the double layering film grain effect uh, to get the twinkles or like the the projection of the clouds. Like all those mm. things work in a in a way that they might not work for me in a more grounded, um, mm. proper Demi film. I adore this film. I adore it too. I would not put it in the ranks of Rochefort or Cherbourg personally. Like if you asked me to put together a list of my top 10 favorite movies on any given day, Rochefort and Cherbourg are very likely to be in there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Donkey Skin is definitely more fanciful, um, than Cherbourg, but I would hardly call Cherbourg realistic either. I would say that similar to A Room in Town and being an opera, essentially. Um, yes, yeah, but, um, it, it is ostensibly beginning with stakes. It is, it's set within <clears throat> a, it, within our world as we know it. Mm-hmm. And it, it's set within a proper timeline and, you know, there's like a grounded, um, 
sense to the characters and what they're going to achieve, right? Whereas the the last line here in Donkey Skin is, um, and it's said that these two lovers would still be madly in love with each other today if they hadn't died a hundred years after they were married. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's just like this lovely, timeless aloofness that the uh, that the narrative has, and I think that mm. for me, it's it suits Demi's um, overall style. Because it lets him get away with whimsy and uh, like really fanciful looking luxuriance without, um, you know, ever losing realism. Yeah. And I mean, it's probably an obvious thing to say since it's a movie based on a fairy tale, but it's like far and away is most childlike, I think. Like it, there are scenes, there are images that just really feel like they are just born out of a, especially a little girl's imagination almost with the mm-hmm. color and the kind of flamboyance of it, um, which is, uh, I, I think it is pretty wonderful, no doubt. I, I, I love this movie. Um, uh, yeah. Um, what else? Is it, yeah, it's based on a French fairy tale. It's from 1970. Did you have any familiarity with this fairy tale beforehand? Yes, uh, cursorily, it's it's um, the original fairy tale that Cinderella's imported on, right? Um, so instead of glass slipper, we we swap that for a ring. Um, but otherwise, fairy tale godmother, um, mm. the incest of the original Cinderella. I th- I think that there's incest in the original Cinderella, so that's that's still maintained, obviously, within Donkey Skin. Um, it's just a lot more upfront about what the original fairy tale was whereas the mm-hmm. disnifying verb of cinderella to common people now um even when you pick up a, a book of cinderella you have to go look for an unedited translation mm-hmm. if you actually want to read like the og stuff um og and, cinderella yeah that's the good good it's th- a lot more like <laughs> the grim fairy tales <laughs> stuff yeah, yeah. because this is a lot of these myths are coming out of the um, the Beltway there of the Black Forest, which is, depending on your year, going to be in Germany or France. It's either going to be in Sudan, Deutschland, South Germany, or in Northern France. Um, and there's just a lot. It was a harsh area, big forest. People died from normal things. And then there were wolves and animals. That's where you get Little Red Riding Hood from. So, uh, yeah, I love fairy tales. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... So, so story-wise, it's a rather simplistic kind of outline, as you would expect from a fairy tale. We meet a king, a queen, their lone daughter, their princess, played by Catherine Deneuve. At the beginning of the film, the queen passes away. Her dying wish is that the king, her husband, remarry, but only remarry a woman more beautiful than she. Mm-hmm. He eventually realizes that the only girl who meets that criteria is his own daughter, Catherine Deneuve. Um which eventually leads to Catherine Deneuve's character running away and uh, hiding beneath the skin of a donkey and taking on the name Donkey Skin to uh, avoid her father's advances. Um, anything you want to add before we really get into it? Um, well, first, I would say that you're missing out on the beautiful out the, the top floor of the castle shot of Catherine Deneuve playing the piano with uh, a parrot who is waiting to sing in. And uh, what is it? Doves? I think it's doves on the ground all around Mm -hmm. her. Um, And just this beautiful, dazzling sparkle um, trick Mm -hmm. that he's, he's putting on the screen. I mean, just the, the ambiance of certain moments there are, that is beautiful. I would also say that, by the end, you learn that the synopsis is really that the fairy tale godmother actually had an agenda, which was to become the queen, and that you just were like diverted attention wise, and that the objective was actually a woman attempting to grasp more power, um, which is quite fun. And then there's the um, the Putney Swope moment, which is when uh, the the metaphorical briefcase comes in by the helicopter. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, there. It's obviously set in a fairy tale uh, land of imagination, but we have these anachronisms: the helicopter at the end, the fairy godmother has a phone. We mm-hmm. see she talks. Uh, what is it? She talks about batteries. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's it, it's just fun to imagine. You know, Demi toying with. The things he knows, uh, 
a, a child would pick out pick up on versus what you experience through the perspective of an adult. I don't think these anachronisms would necessarily really register to a kid. Um, but uh, and especially things like the fairy godmother's whole game to you know reach the throne herself. I don't know that that would even really connect with a young viewer. Yeah, um, that's kind of the point of the the fairy tale is that it means different things to different people at different points in time. That's like the classic purpose of it is it's a metaphorical truth that changes as you change. Um, one of my my favorite bits is when they're talking after he's trying to engage her in a marriage mm-hmm. and he begins to reference his books on the future mm-hmm. that he got from her fairy godmother and... Uh, you know, that no one knows more about the future than her. And these these books are really something. You have to read them. They tell you all about the future. Um, I I love that detail. And then the prince, the lovesick prince, and his mm. uh, his kind of group of quack doctors that all, oh, yeah. you know, just are total idiots and imbeciles. Um, it It's so passively elegant. The mm-hmm. storytelling there, just visually and passive ver- verbiage, like it's it's not more than a minute, and it's not expositional dialogue. It's just dialogue, and it makes a such a beautiful point that you could just see, um, you know, like someone in the eighteen hundreds trying to teach their kid about like bullshit and just reference that one part in the fairy tale. Yeah, yeah. Um. Oh, uh, where should we go from here? Um. I don't know, talk to me just about the look of the movie. You know, how would you describe it to someone who's never laid eyes on don- Donkey Skin before? As someone who's never laid eyes on Demi before, this was my first shock to me, and also my most recent since I rewatched it this morning. Um, he is fabulous. Uh, I think Fabulous, that, that's a good word. I think that my, my second viewing... I didn't realize what he was doing when she was in this um, metaphorical transition that is cued to us visually in which she's put on the donkey skin and she's in her um, her godmother's carriage going mm. to the new town castle kingdom. Uh, and it's this beautiful, luxuriant carriage that's unconventional. It's, uh, it's a two-draw horse uh, single line. Rather than two horses side by side carrying, which is like our, our traditional carriage or wagon. This is two horses in a line, so it's ostensibly just for visual, right? Mm-hmm. And then it's like a normal road, and then we cut to, and it's a different angle, and we're looking at it, and the road's now muddy, and the carriage just looks a little bit different. Mm-hmm. You don't really know what's going on. And then it it changes again, and the horses are still there, but the wagon is now this uh, this straw, really low poverty type uh, carriage. Not at all the luxuriant thing that we were in before. And then we turn again, and the horses are gone, and she's in the town now. And then it turns again as she hops out, and what she's hopping out of is just a straw stack. There's no wagon anymore, mm-hmm. and it's it's just like beat 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 beautiful visuals telling you something that they could have told you verbally that i i've just i've never seen visuals communicated like just with such passive confidence and like almost genius you know like like how else are you going to make me feel like magic occurred as eloquently without using cg i just i can't imagine a better thing and when she jumps out of the straw the world is frozen. Yeah, it's all slow motion from her exit from the castle all the way down this carriage ride and into the the new village. And that's how we know it's like this magical transition. But it's not frozen, frozen. The people are frozen. But the horses in the town, they can still look. Paper is still blown by the wind. A horse's tail still swishes. And then when she goes and meets the uh, old woman, right? That's what she wants to be called. The yeah. old woman. The, Not the hag wants to be called the old woman. So funny. Um, and that's when time kicks back in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And she coughs up her toad. Um, that I think is just like one of the most perfect moments. If I'm not going to choose like Lola walking down the stairs in Lola. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, like the whole movie is is within this fairy tale wonderland, but that stretch, her getaway from her father, is one of the stretches that feels truly surreal as she's moving through the world of the movie. And I remember when she makes that transition from the like ordinary carriage to the 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 one that's full of hay or sticks or whatever. I remember almost having to do a double take. I was like, did I miss somewhere where she changed buses or changed carriages? carriages um it that one is literally dreamlike and it's kind of mm-hmm. just visual logic it's very satisfying um but yeah i mean I, I i do very much appreciate the just kind of extravagance of the mise-en-scene in general and the and the vividness of it um but i especially like how um you know this the the kind one of the central kind of themes of the movie is what's kind of natural versus unnatural. And I think you really get that just in the production design where in like the castle that Deneuve's father lives in, you have all those vines crawling up the walls. You see Deneuve's bed that looks like a forest floor. You know, Mm -hmm. she had the green mattress that just, that looks like moss with flowers coming off of it. And the castle itself looks kind of stagey. It looks cheap in a very incredibly charming way. Like it's, it's you just feel the staginess of it um but this uh you know idea within the the design itself um about what's natural and what's unnatural i think just feeds perfectly into the the beats of the story itself and that that unnatural kind of continues into the other castle i would say where the mother and the king or the queen and the king rather don't want their son the prince to um marry someone who isn't a princess because it's unnatural mm-hmm. to them and then there's all these unnatural men who are those idiots mm-hmm. um you know just kind of doubles down on that point but then the you know that makes you think like the fairy godmother well she lives in a meadow or a grotto right and mm-hmm. the first time you see her there's this this lovely deer in frame right mm-hmm. and it's just like well if she's the natural world then maybe the marriage between them was like a good natural one. And, mm. you know, it's, it's an interesting film because I don't, I, I think it's not just an interesting film. It's an interesting fairy tale because I don't really know what to like the, if she sees the future and she knew that Catherine Deneuve would fall in love with this prince and marry him, then it is good. But she didn't tell her what was going to happen. Um, and so it's, you know, it, it, it's got that interesting, um, middle line there where there's plenty of room for moral debates on mm-hmm. axioms of truth and forcing people down roads that they don't know that they're going down, that you know what, that they're going down. Um, I just, yeah, I really appreciate the source material and the way that Demi is passively sharing the source material. Yeah, there's, there's very much a, like, sinister underside of this movie in how the the fairy godmother is is obviously not looking out for the interests of Deneuve or hardly even really cares about what happens to her it's just about her own kind of strategy for finagling her way into the throne um and I th- the the final sequence i think is so kind of just uh unsettling when the the king says to Deneuve we'll never be separated again and you can tell uh he's not happy about having married the very godmother having been you know finagled into this marriage um there's something very very unsettling to me about that after we already know his um his desires yes um however mm-hmm. the fairy godmother kept Deneuve from having to marry her father it's true and have true. children with him so also a hero <laughs> <laughs> it is true. It's that, right? It's, there's plenty of room there for that moral debate. That's what I love. Um, as equally as I love coughing up toads and um, beautiful, beautiful lighting um, between the natural lighting and the, the artificial lighting and the interiors. Um, that room, the dressier room where they're they're making these uh, preposterously difficult dresses. Mm-hmm. Uh, that are you know just formidably gorgeous like just 
dazzling to behold. Um, and they're, it's like this ornate dress room. There's people in there laboring. There's someone like in the middle of the cradle of the loom, just slamming it down. Um, and there's like an astrolabe on the side of the loom. I don't know if you noticed that. It's like this absurd detail, right? Because she's asking for the weather, the moon and the sun. So they mm-hmm. have to like go look at the, and so that that's just like this great little detail. Yeah. You, you could watch the whole movie and pay attention strictly to the costumes. You, you get the, the dresses Deneb's wearing, the, the cape that uh, her father's wearing, the Blue King, this purple cape with, like, gigantic shoulder pads, essentially, underneath. Or it looks like he's got wings. Um, and, and production design, like, in the uh, prince's castle, in uh, the throne room of his parents, there's that, like, statue behind them of, a, like, a nymph with butterfly wings and a rainbow and again that's just the the kind of thing that just seems to me like that is that that feels like a um very uh, like something out of the mind of a little girl a very Mm -hmm. feminine kind of imagination um yeah just just very 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 original i cannot compare too many of the images in this movie to, to any other movie off the top of my head yes um it, it's worth so you were talking about kind of the the darker underside of the film which is not only incestual mm. manipulative you know uh witches those types of things it's also um you know the contest for fitting the ring you get this fantastic mm. sequence in which the girls the maidens of the town the, all the single ladies essentially are putting their fingers in vices and wrapping their fingers in twine to try to, you know, force the finger brutally down. Um, and that's just like this great, brutal, like human touch to the film that I, I think was really passively eloquent to tell that that story that is actually within the fairy tale of, you know, the brutality of wanting something and what you're willing to do to get it. Um you know, there's there's just so many rich lessons in here. I kind of can't believe that you could make something so dazzlingly gorgeous that tells such, um, you know, negative um, truths. Yeah, there's the guy who looks like he's dressed as like a wizard. Like it looks like mm-hmm. a, the a kind of wizard costume you buy at like Party America who's selling, like, I can't remember if it's, like, a potion or something like that to girls to slim their fingers uh-huh. down so that'll fit, and it's just, it's garbage. It does the opposite or something like that. You know, again, people just looking out for themselves, taking advantage of other people. Um, Snake oil metaphor. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but yeah, the guy's costume itself is just so funny. This just, like, kind of stereotypical image, almost like a wizard with a, with a hat with stars on it. Mm-hmm. Like, I think I literally wore that outfit as, like, a kid at one point. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that. <laughs> and Michael's dressed like that now. Yes, yes. Um, so the, the other thing is the nature of the donkey skin. We should probably get into that. Um, the donkey itself, shat, jewels, gold, wealth. Why wouldn't it? (laughs) And that's kind of your golden goose, you know, fairy tale. And, um, kind of what happens in the film is the fairy godmother tells her to increasingly ask for these incredibly hard to replicate ideas for dresses. First the weather, then the moon, then the sun. Mm-hmm. And then the donkey hide itself is is her final request. Um, and before that, we'd seen a golden platter being used as the uh, defecatory spot mm-hmm. for the donkey in which all the, the jewels and the gold and the diamonds are, are landing. And um, there's something not only great visually there, but there there's just such a rich metaphor there. Um, when you pair that with the incestual desire thing, like I just, I can't get over how great the messages of the original fairy tale seem to resonate in this visual presentation of it. And the donkey skin itself is a very memorable image because it has this kind of gross interior that really looks like the inside of a, of a a thing of skin. Yeah. Yeah. It's got the meat in there. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um yeah. The hooves are being dragged around, you know. The the eye itself looks ominous whenever you see the donkey eye and like you actually look at it. It it's got a you know a negative feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um Oh, what else? Um the uh the, these are more just uh factoids i think the the guy who plays catherine Deneuve's father um jacques perrin i think is his name um mm-hmm. was the actor who played uh the beast in jacques Co- jean cocteau's the beauty and the beast oh wow um okay. which was uh like a, a major kind of a jumping off point for demi and making this one i thought that was kind of an interesting uh tip of the hat to uh to a uh, to a, a film that influenced him, um, yeah. And what else? What else? What else stood out to you? Um, well, comparatively, now that I've seen a few um, other Demi films, I feel like there were no trick shots in here. If I was to equate this to Pool, mm-hmm. kind of, um, mm-hmm. Demi in his other films has kind of performed these visual trick shots. I think that uh, Umbrellas. I, I would point directly to that opening scene with the straight down at the cobblestones rain. Just oh, like the this, opening shot. Yeah, mm-hmm. just like this fantastic mm-hmm. opening shot. Um, Bay of Angels, in which he literally just goes, look at what I can do. And he throws mm-hmm. his camera down the boardwalk really fast on a motorcycle. And it's just gorgeous. I don't think that he does really a performative you know, trick shot behind the back, sink the eight ball in the furthest corner that he can type of a move here. And that was, that's kind of interesting, I think, because um, it, it seemed, it had seemed watching those films like that was something that he tended to do one or two times per film. And here I, I would say that it's more like editing choices that he really focused on, rather than really getting that that great spectacular shot that kind of defines your memory of the film. Yeah, it definitely feels more like an invisible kind of direction he uses here. Maybe I would think just because he knows that there's already so much splendor in the costumes, in the sets, there's already so much to drink in that you, he doesn't need to do as much camera movement wise or or anything like that because the the mise-en-scene kind of speaks for itself once you turn on the camera yeah or maybe you know like it could be the the uh the restrictions of shooting on set location you know just Mm -hmm. that you can't really pull off a trick shot like you could just in like a normal cityscape you know I'm, i'm also thinking of like the end of umbrellas where it's just like this kind of incredible snapshot photograph dolly up of the SO station as it's snowing, right? Like, Mm -hmm. that's just something that feels universal. Mm -hmm. And I I think that there's maybe a lack of the same type of, you know, modernistic realism universality to these images, but there's also something implicitly shared between us that it, it has a very feminine motif, but I think it also has a universal motif and that, that fairy tale storytelling of, you know, her kind of being, you know, unsure of herself in circumstances that she didn't choose kind of going down the road and it feels like she's moving through time, but no time has passed you know, those types of things. I, I think there were very interesting choices. They're just very different than the other choices I've seen him make in his, in um, his oeuvre so far. Yeah. I mean, the other ones, especially something like Lola, um, since it isn't a, a musical to the extent that Umbrellas and Rochefort are, uh, you know, feels like a very distinctly French new wave kind of filmmaking. Um, versus... That was his first one. I think that was his debut. Yeah. 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 Um, Versus something uh, like Donkey Skid that almost seems more indebted to like like really early cinema. You know, we don't really get these you know any any brio with the camera movement per se. But like you already mentioned a little bit, we get effects. We get the um, these little flashes of light that make it seem like the the screen is almost just sparkling like mm-hmm. when there's a dress on screen or when we see Deneuve's house in the woods at one point there's kind of this sparkle effect around it um and there are those jump cuts we get when 
the god fairy godmother changes dresses, dresses changes yes. clothes. That that feels like Melier or something like that. Um, in You're sort right, of it does the, feel the, the very analog kind of effect, the fairy godmother falls through the roof um, at one point into Deneuve's room and gets out because the footage is just kind of being reversed of what we already saw. Mm-hmm. It feels very sort of um, charmingly primitive in a way. But it's still, it's so elegant and char- charmant that it just, it feels true. Um, yeah, I, the, I want to go back to the house. So the prince arrives at the house uh, when he decides to get up and go for a walk after having an argument that made me laugh. I'm now forgetting the details of it. But he was sitting at a table and they had an argument over something that's just hilarious. Mm -hmm. Um, And he stands up and he puts his entire scabbard, not just his sword, his entire scabbard into his belt. Like he had taken it out to sit down, which is this great like place in time effect. And he he walks into the woods and stumbles on her house. And he walks into what appears to be like a a force field, Mm -hmm. which is very funny to me to begin with. But um, to actually sell this rather than to do some sort of a trick, they do some sort of a non-marring plexiglass. Yeah. Like, I don't understand what trick they did, but they do a reverse shot where they're just looking at him with the forest background and he's pressing his fingers against some sort of a glassy material that doesn't let a fingerprint stay on it Mm -hmm. so that you can't tell that he pushed against it. And he literally ends up walking around that force field or whatever it is, but it's, it's just an incredible way of physically making the magic real passively in the story without any dialogue exposition it's just something that's true and it it, like that's one of those things that floors me but it's it feels very very unlike the other demis that i've seen it's he he went like a totally different way here um in his filmmaking process it's it's very uh i i think that it requires even more study for me to figure out what exactly his arc is and what's kind of the experimental process here I think there's even a sound there as he walks into the plexiglass mm-hmm. that feels very convincing. Like it's almost slapstick, you know, yes. where you see someone walk through a, a door that they think is open, but it's a glass door. It's the uh-huh. same kind of little collision. Um, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a funny scene um, for sure. Um, I think as he's walking towards Deneuve's house d- to that scene he stops and sees the the flower with the mouth on it and an eye i think that yes. tells him to keep walking down the path i think that's one thing that was an homage to to beauty and the beast was mm. the talking flowers um which is just an, an you know a nice little uh fantastic uh touch um lots of that kind of thing yeah it's there's so much beauty but there's so much like depth here um i i guess what do you think of the the parrot oh the parrot's hilarious that has uh a little refrain that it keeps singing something it had something about love i should have written down what the actual phrase is oh parrot's a great little side character he, he's uh he's repeating her song which is like um love love i love you more or something um but in french it's and not in my voice, in Catherine's voice. It's much more beautiful and cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know, any, any any favorite details of the design? Favorite costume? Um, I mean, those those shoulder pads that you mentioned. Like, oh, I feel yeah. like we should we should get a little bit more in there. They're not just shoulder pads. It's like arm shrouds. Oh, like, they're big. He, he has this giant cape. But this, these shoulder pads aren't just shoulder pads. They're, they create an enveloping cape for each arm, like a like a exaggerated ornamental shoulder pad or something, right? Because the cape is is in the back and it's got its own fabric. But then each arm has its own separate fabric that is linear to the ground with that same cape and so there's just like this ginormous extravagance oh i know let's get to the cake 
Oh yeah, the cake the cake making scene, all yes, of that. Yes. So she's um. So th- this is maybe where we differ on our interpretations of the fairy godmother, because the fairy godmother gave her the wand, the ability to go anywhere and essentially make a magical place that that she would feel comfortable in, and also all those books to achieve what she wants. Um. Mm-hmm. And so without the fairy godmother giving her those books, then she wouldn't actually get to make the prince fall in love with her, which is its own mm-hmm. moral quandary. But still, I I think that the prince maybe fell in love with her before through the window, if yeah, I was going to be yeah. charitable. So, I would think so. Um, so there's there's this great cake making sing scene where she's singing and, um, you know, it says four handfuls of flour or four general generous handfuls of flour. It's, it's just this beautiful scene. But uh, about halfway through the scene, she has to get the butter out. Mm-hmm. And her right sleeve is just constantly like this beautiful dress with this giant ornate sleeve is just constantly dragging in and out of the butter. Oh, I don't think I even noticed it that. It is this hilarious <laughs> sequence because she she's like been dragging it in and out of the butter and then she has to go cut it and put it in the uh, in the cake at the end. And it's just like there's there's this great comedic tone underneath the film um right because there's already comedy overtly but if you're just watching the visuals and the accidents that are happening because of these giant ornate costumes um i think that there's yeah there's there's great filmmaking here (laughs) yeah that's one scene that almost feels like you could just you could picture that in in a disney fairy tale Mm -hmm. where that's where some animals come out of the woodwork some squirrels come in the window with a bird to help her absolutely get two pinches of that and two tablespoons of this um very charming scene for sure i I thought you were gonna say that's one of those scenes where you could just bottle it and sell it because i I think you could (laughs) that too um great scene for sure this is one of my few exposures to denouve um i've obviously seen her since in uh umbrellas but what do you think about her filmography entry here and, and in general? Well, I think she's one of the best ever do it. I'll put it that way. Um, I I mean, I think I probably, well, now I was about to say I prefer her in Umbrellas or Rochefort. I actually don't think that's true. I think she's pretty delightful across those three. Um, uh, I mean, other stuff that comes to mind is something like uh, Belle de Jour, the, 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 the Bunuel film. Um uh, I think she did multiple with Boonwell, right? Tristana, too. Um, I think she's fantastic. I'll answer the question that way. What about you? I, I agree that she's fantastic. I don't think that I've had enough exposure, and I'm, I'm just kind of floored that this is the type of star power that she has. And just, like, where her place is in cinema now, knowing that she's still, you know, alive and p- capable of acting, it's just kind of, um, you know historically interesting that that, like someone this dazzling of a star would have the equivalent of like no star power today it it just seems preposterous it's like imagining if i well i guess it's it's exactly like mark hamill having no star power today you know someone Mm -hmm. who was just giant in the 70s and the 80s and then just kind of devolving into guest appearances and cameos um in his older age it's it's a curious prospect. Yeah. I mean, I th- within the Demi films, I think it's just kind of the innocence that he's really tapping into that, yeah. that makes her very endearing. Um, it feels very different from other, you know, French new wave icons. Like when we talked about Elevator to the Gallows, someone like Jeanne Moreau is much more sullen, you know, and mm-hmm. seems... Like she's probably capable of much more than Deneuve is in these kinds of films, um, where there's almost something more. Um, I was about to say childlike. That's really kind of an exaggeration, but certainly an innocence or a naivete, I guess. Yeah, I, that's that's part of what's interesting with Demi is that he's <clears throat> he's asking these characters. It seems like to just kind of be themselves and say things and act emotionally resonant to whatever they they would act that emotion out as and then he's shooting it in different ways i I think that um lola for me is like the greatest example of that in which it's it's just this dazzling gorgeousness 
kind of a light fisheye lens that he's using for its entirety uh, on a nuke of me or Amy, I forget the last name. Mm. Um, but he's really relying on the emotional resonance actually of our, our main male character um, by the end, which is, is not something during its runtime that I had expected until literally those last three minutes. It's just kind of this, um, you know, level of genius and just shifting the perspective entirely and putting all the weight there. And it's it's a different process here. I, I definitely have more work to do with Demi. I don't quite know what his thing is yet. Yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful thing, whatever it is. It is, uh, because it certainly is donkey skin. <laughs> yeah um yeah i mean i, I kind of like how you know relative to something like cinderella where the whole plot beat is a uh, whoops i lost my slipper and then the the prince is really kind of the one taking action and chain and and uh tracking her down the prince does tracking down here but it's really something that denov's character set in motion herself putting the ring in the, the cake. cake. Yeah. Um, I think there's kind of a unique agency given to her in this movie while also still recognizing her kind of a uh, childlike worldview. Um, you know, she is protected in that little house. Debbie puts her in a glass box so that the guy can't possibly do anything to her. Um, uh, I think he, it's, it, it's, it's a little different than like the Disney princess kind of thing where they're, they, they're usually a little bit more subject to the whims of the men, it seems like Demi's almost kind of looking out for her more than usual. Yeah. So mm-hmm. what I, well, I feel like that's true. I, I would make the point again that the, rather than the men forcing their agenda, it's the fairy godmother forcing her agenda. Very because true. the book to cast that <laughs> cake spell with the ring is from the book that she gives her. Um, and that there, there feels to be an agency for her to choose to use the book cake spell on the boy that comes to her her glass castle in in the middle of the woods if you will but it's it's a it's just rich for uh different interpretations and then moral uh axiomatic arguments about them very godmother's pulling some strings for mm-hmm. sure she is the uh puppet master pulling the strings from her helicopter <clears throat> um i mean it's it's a film that's incredibly dense, but I, I don't know that I have much more to say, unfortunately. Um, it's it's just kind of, I mean, number one, I would highly recommend the film to anyone, whether they're experienced with Demi or not. I think that this is perhaps his most approachable film, which might sound garish uh, to anybody that's seen his entire filmography. But I think the donkey skin is just, if you grew up, with any sort of Disney, you're going to have a quick segue into understanding this film language. Assuming they can uh, get on board with the, with the incest dimension. I would think that might be <laughs> eyebrow raising for I some. I mean, if you grew up with Disney, you're already <laughs> familiar. <laughs> favorite scene? <clears throat> favorite scene. Or favorite detail. Costume. Set. We can be open ended on that one. Um, boy. Favorite sequence is that transition of the wagon. But my favorite mm. scene is him, uh, you know, metaphorically taking up space in the window and then the camera becoming him. And then we get to be the camera looking down into the courtyard while Deneuve is singing, playing piano. Uh, yeah, that's our introduction, mm-hmm. I think, right? Wonderful way to meet our character um it seems we haven't talked about that is one of my favorites is the little dream sequence the prince has um where he imagines himself with the din of like frolicking in a field they literally are like rolling on the ground he's doing somersaults yeah yeah it's reversed i think Uh the footage is and they're like feasting on a cake um again just the kind of uh the, the child-like nature of that, you know, doing somersaults. This isn't Terrence Malick twirling. Denova is just rolling on the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, it's pretty it's pretty fun and unique. And it's like, uh, 
it's a visual cue to the idea of being lovesick. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, that's donkey skin. And that's another one in the can. Now you don't. <laughs>